We're kicking it off. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Welcome to this week's Cosmic Conversation about Pauline Oliveros. Uh, most famous for uh, being part of the San Francisco, San Francisco Tape Music San Francisco, Center. So. San Francisco. San Francisco Tape Music Center. Um, there's much more to her than that, but that is the thing that usually comes up the most uh, when we mention her. Um, so we've been doing some Whether she likes it or in. not, I feel like I don't know. She even... lived a long life. Um, I guess we can just dive into some of the timeline about... Um, well, I think most significantly she was there during the formation of it. She was. She is part of the founding group, and uh, she was the director from 1966 to 1967. Very brief time. She was teaching at Mills College as well as we were space. So, so How did you... Jacqueline originally hear about of Paulina Oliveros? Um, you know, I don't remember the exact, I don't have like a story about the exact time that I heard about her, but um, it was definitely through uh, learning about Mort Sabotnik and mm. about San Francisco Don Tate Music Bukla Center. and the San Francisco Tate Music So Center. she was that, wrapped up in that. She was wrapped up in that because when we were um, living in California and we saw a performance, of Mort Sabotnik. Oh man, that's I mean, that's and that kind of the, got me. That got me hooked even deeper than I already was. Most memorable times of my life, honestly. Yeah. So at um, Red Cat. But we're not here to talk about Mort Sabotnik. He's just kind of one of the players. Um, so as we were saying, he's one of Pauline's good friends. Yeah, definitely. Um, she was born in 1932 in Texas, Houston, Texas. And she has very early memories. So this is one of the threads that I've found with a lot of the people that we've been studying. Yeah. They have early memories of being curious about sound. Right. I think that's the key is they and remember discovering interesting like, aspects of sound. Uh, a lot of those threads tie to the radio age. So obviously we talk about early electronic music in the space age, but that's sort of when all of these people were like in their early adulthood was the space age is you know what influenced their sound but they all came up in the radio age when um you know the sound of radio had a very unique quality and i think you know dialing into radio um we had to be a bit of a, sense, an enthusiast yeah. like a lot of I their dads were like shortwave radio they guys. probably remember their parents yeah their fathers mothers being enthusiasts about having a radio because mm -hmm. not everybody had one. It was kind of like a TV. Yeah. When it first came out, it was like you kind of had to be a little bit of a techie to even own one, right? Yeah, so one of the things that she talks about as being really formative for her is that her dad had a crystal radio. And I looked that up and now I want to build one. <laughs> so that's probably going to be the first super thing. Super hard to build. No, these it's days. pretty basic, yeah. but she said that, you know, because you would like manually tune to the frequencies to try to you know connect with the radio signal she heard the sounds of like the tuning and the in between the radio stations is what really piqued her interest and her curiosity about sound and i really connected with that idea um i don't know if any of you guys have had that kind of experience when you know you're tuning into the radio the sound that's in between uh, the, the way the sounds sort of like blend together and create something altogether new um well, there's that point at which maybe you're in between two stations and like you're almost to where the next station's gonna be clear and it starts to come in. Like you can hear like the, mm, the modulated really signal. Yeah, yeah and, and you can kind of like, it's almost like fading in, but it's it's different than, you know, like a volume fade. It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, you hear it start to be modulated you know, like to, to where you, it's intelligible, um, you know, enough to know what station it is, or at least that it's a, the next Yeah, I would almost like station. just leave it there and mm -hmm. listen to that. Yeah. <laughs> Rather yeah. than the, the pop music or whatever that's on the radio. I would like to build a tube radio, honestly, <laughs> if, we, if we do it at all. That's really next level. That's what we'd want to do. Um, so she remembers like being in the backseat of her parents' car and like hearing the sound of you know other cars through the window mixed with the tuning of the radio and it was like this whole world to her of sound and music that i think you know was pretty she said unique. that she remembered hearing her parents voices modulated by the sound yes, of yes. the engine that's um, right 
which, you know, even if you, if there's like a loud fan in the room, it kind of creates yeah. this amplitude modulation. Um, you know, I, I remember growing up in Florida, for example, there's a lot of big ceiling fans in a yes. lot of the houses and they're like in every business. And like, I specifically remember the sound of like hearing people talk against the, you know, the fan spinning and, and hearing this like, kind of like robotic tone that would come from it. And I had no idea at the time, like what that was, but it was definitely piqued my interest. I always find it interesting whenever we're about to start a new week of uh, covering someone, I'll have an experience like a couple days before we start that is like totally tied into what we're talking about. And I'm just having a flashback to that because this week I was having that experience where I was, I was like humming to something and it was like being modulated by a sound in the room. And I can't remember what it was now, but I was like, that is so weird. The I kitchen think. sink, I think. Maybe. Or like, no, it was the dishwasher. The dishwasher. And I've just been like really tuned into that. And so it's weird that we're going into Paulina Oliveros now because she's all about deep listening. So the, the theme what of is her deep life listening? is deep listening, even Let's though she didn't coin that, that term until the 80s. So um, we're going to jump around like we always do uh, because these themes kind of tie together more than like the chronology of her life. Uh, so deep listening is probably what she's the most known for. She has a foundation and she does workshops on this, but the way it all started, I'm doing like a boo, boo. Okay, back in 1981, she went to um, the players that we were talking about earlier from the San Francisco Tape Music Center and all the I like that, the, the people, players. The players. Stuart Dempster and Paniotis. So those are the two guys I think Stuart Dempster was the instigator for this. He said, hey, I'm gonna go check out this cistern in Washington State. Um, she was living in New York at the time. And she went out there um, and it was uh, a deep, deep, deep cistern underneath a cathedral, I believe. Um, and they went down there just to listen. Uh, I heard her in an interview, somebody asked her like, wait, what were you going to do like a performance down there? Were you guys like scoping it out to do a performance? And she said, no, we just went to listen. I could see somebody being like, hey, Polly, and do you want to go listen? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you want to go listen, man? Let's go to the cistern. So exciting. She was really interested in uh, spaces and sound in space. That's something, another theme that comes up a lot with the people we've talked about. Obviously Stockhausen was big on that too. But um, just the idea of, you know, she was a traditional composer. She played a lot in concert halls and she was really interested in how sound changes depending on the space that you're playing the music in. And so I think that's why they were always like scoping out spaces. But she was really into just listening to, like we said when she was really young in the backseat of the car, just listening. Just listening to sound, listening to nature, listening to echoes, you know, how does the sound in the space change when you are in it? It's usually the beginning of any one of these, you know, we, we've researched so many of these folks at this point and have a lot more to research. Yeah. But, but it always seems so like the first threads, yeah. like scene of the documentary mm -hmm. is, I remember listening to. Yeah, like Daily Derby Shire mentions <laughs> the sounds of the air raid sirens. Right. Is, uh, that's what like influenced the first her scene of her documentary? Yeah. exactly. That's what so. I'm, um, I'm so sorry. It was 1988. 1981 is when she moved to New York. 1988 is when she descended into a 14 feet uh, cistern, <laughs> underground cistern in Washington. Um, and they did bring a sound engineer with them. She claims that they just went to listen, but they thought it would be a waste not to have somebody to record while they were down there. Um, and they ended up, Rome. they ended up making a whole album. Um, and what I love is that she's a very dry, but she claims that deep listening is a pun that had them like rolling on the floor laughing, <laughs> that they were just yeah. jokesters and punsters. But she tells it with like such a straight face that I'm like, that's her level of like the deep listening it. really came from the fact that they were like 30 were deep, feet, or 14 feet or 14 feet yeah, down on the ground. Under, under. Know? And that's, it was deep. <laughs> it was literally deep. deep. <laughs> she, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. She talks about focal attention and global attention. So 
this image that she created that eventually got like more and more elaborate over the years is just like a dot and then a larger circle. So focal attention and global attention in terms of listening and sound. Um, and in everyday life, are you able to listen like focused and global all at the same time? That's what she talks about, like being able to hear everything all at the same time. And how that, I think, is a spiritual practice that can help you as a person and in, you know, getting to know yourself and communicating with other people, which she does have some, you know, deeper philosophies about. But um, just in terms of hearing sound around you and how you perceive uh, what is music, you know. You know, bringing it back to tape music, which is what we're all here for. Um, when she got her, she got her first uh, tape recorder when she was 21. And her, she got it from Sears Roebuck. Sears and Roebuck. Sears and Roebuck. And then she got a second one from Sears and Roebuck. Silvertone, I believe. Yes. Which was like a Sears brand. Mm. They made guitars, gotcha. they made microphones, they made like all this audio equipment. It was all Silvertone. And that was kind of like the... The Sears Roebuck brand of Sears Roebuck brand. sound equipment. Yeah, and now a lot of it is like, you know, coveted and, you know, sought after. Another term that she coined is sonic awareness, and I think that's more of like what I was talking about with the focal attention and the global attention. Um, the ability to consciously focus attention upon environmental and musical sound, requiring continual alertness and an inclination to be always listening. That makes my head hurt. And I like want to be the person that can do that, but I am not. Well, I think it's one of those things Continual that... Continual alertness. There's a tie-in with meditation to these mm -hmm. concepts, and I feel like that's something... It's like that a way of kinda, being. Yeah. It's like a muscle that you can strengthen. There are times when I feel more connected to my ability to be able to do that, but it's definitely not natural for me and probably others. Like It's, it's something you really have to work at. Um, and that I think has a lot to do with her practice and style and, you know, course that she developed yeah. around it. There's actually a workshop and a certification program that you can take online, um, through this, uh, college in New York that they have a partnership with, uh, where you can be certified in deep listening. When do we get to talk about, she had a lot of cool friends. She I did. Think, like Terry Riley. Oh yeah, so Terry Riley is one of the first people that she met and started improvising with. Um, she was there during the NC recording. Yes. That took place. Steve Wright played the piano. At the San Francisco Tape Music Center, I think. Yeah. Uh, Lauren uh, Rush. Yes, so Lauren Rush composer. and Terry Riley, the, the three of them, that was the first uh, sort of experimental improvised music to tape that uh, she was part of. Uh, this is in 1957, 1958. Uh, they're at uh, San Francisco Going State. Going back in time. San Francisco State University. Um, they all met there and they started collaborating together. Um, she discusses that if they tried to plan anything, if they even tried to talk about you know, what they were going to do, she said it would just fall flat. It was a big plus one for improvisation as so a composition technique. Just, they would just start playing and listening to each other, and then something amazing would happen. And they would record to tape, and she did not like to splice. So this is a very different approach to tape music than a lot of the people we've talked about so far who would make the composition in sort of a, I would say, a more traditional approach where they're building the song note by note, but using tape and splicing. Um, whereas her and most of the guys at the San Francisco Tape Music Center, when they saw, you know, those bigger electronic studios that they visited, when they were splicing and doing all kinds of complicated maneuvers to build the compositions, they were really turned off by it. And, you know, I've seen a lot of them say, just like splicing, no, not for me. Uh, so they would just, you know, record. But she was super into tape delay. Yeah, so and obviously tape delay still techniques using, and using yeah. multiple tape machines I want to find to that article. Artificially create like different acoustic environments. Like she used 
I think, you know, looping, you know, like that way, basically like... Yeah, she said Terry Riley always sound, would have sound. these like giant loops all around the studio. Like strung up. And she tried it. Like she said she was always like when she was intrigued by a technique like that, she would try it and then be like, okay, got the free t-shirt. What is it called? The Expanded Instrument, Instrument System. System. Yeah, that was her, her jam. So that was her jam. It originated as tape machines um, that she would basically create different delays out of, but eventually it evolved into a computer controlled um, way of manipulating lexicon delay units and changing the different presets and the different settings with like foot pedals and it's very elaborate. Um, but yeah, she had somebody write it into software in the early 90s uh, when opcode max came out yeah she was really ahead of the, the game and i would imagine having the um you know she obviously was exposed to technology at a very early age and had one of the first tape recorders that were commercially available and then was part of the san francisco tape music center where people obviously we know don buchla was there building synthesizers and um, all kinds of things she said that nothing against yet. don but I don't like the sound of transistors. She <laughs> did pieces on the Buchla 100. She said out of we've heard before. <laughs> necessity, but she didn't like the sound of the transistor-based oscillator. She preferred the tube oscillators, you know, used in test equipment. And she was really into the idea of like tuning them beyond the range of human hearing, like to oh, yeah. 40 kilohertz. So, uh, and then getting her... the difference frequencies. Yeah. And having them, the basically the, you know, she would tune it super, super high, like way out of human hearing range. And then she would listen to the way that it modulated, uh, like another sound, you know, like a chorus or something like that. And it would create these different frequencies. And she said, you couldn't quite do that as well mm, with right. a like, transistor based mm -hmm. uh, oscillator. So I, I found that really interesting. So um, there is a, one of her first well, this is one of her first tape compositions, I believe, um, called Bye Bye Butterfly, which I believe is the difference, frequency, the difference frequency. One of them, yeah, one of her experiments. And the fact that it, you know, you, you can take something out of our range, you know, yeah, our ability to That is to so cool, I never would have thought of that. And it, its byproduct is something that we can perceive and it's predictable. Um, if anybody's familiar with, you know, how a ring modulator works, you get the, um, the difference and the sum frequencies and it kind of creates, it's more of a mul multiplicative, uh, property and you, you get sort of like the multiplication of the two sources creates like an entirely, uh, new frequency, you know, so I, I found that really interesting, um, when I started learning more and more about how a ring modulator works um, you know so I think you know she's sort of playing with one aspect of that scenario that's with right. the difference frequencies yeah that that leads me to another thing that she brought up which she has like we were talking about the the focal attention and the global attention how she made this visualization for herself of a dot and then a large circle and eventually that turned into quadrants and I don't want to get this wrong but I believe one of them is you know, awareness and then actively listening and then experiencing that sound and then remembering the past sound. And then I guess you can just like keep going around. Oh, wow. She was an accordion mm -hmm. player. Yeah. So to go back to her childhood, she started accordion at age nine. Her mom was a piano player. And I guess accordion was super popular. This would have been 1941. Uh, so she started on accordion and she then went on to play like French horn and tuba and oboe, and she's pretty much played every one of those traditional instruments, violin, um, and went to college for music as well. Um, got her BFA at San Francisco State University. And then, ah, the thread that brings everybody together is that there was a composition teacher um, in San Francisco at the time that um, everybody wanted to study with. His name was Robert Erickson. Thank you for mentioning yes. that. Yeah. So I believe through Terry Riley and Lauren Rush. Ramon Sender was another person that studied yeah. with him. So all of these people, all these players, you know, Terry Riley, Steve Wright, uh, Lauren Rush, um, Ramon Sender, Ramon Sender uh, 
They all studied with Robert Erickson. That was the common thread. And Terry they, Riley. Yeah, you I, said, him? I okay. said Terry Riley. Yeah. So, um, and they, all these people are friends. Morton Sabotnik, everybody. They all studied with him. They all met each other through this uh, composition class program. And he was like a mentor to them. Um, they did private lessons. Students and, of Bob. Yeah, and improvised with him. And then um, Ramon Sender tells a story about how uh, when he started the San Francisco Tape Music Center, they did... Um, these performances, um, they were trying to get like sponsorships. So sort of like how, uh, you know, you do like a Patreon now. They were trying to get people to do like a monthly subscription uh, to support the, the building of the studio. And so they did these performances and they didn't have enough tape music to play because they, nobody had really done it yet. And so they did improvised performances to kind of fill the, the space and then Anybody who had a tape music composition, they would just play it. But I thought that was interesting. It wasn't hard to get into the tape music game back then. You had to know one of these four people that were doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you could definitely get some airtime pretty easy. But then they eventually, uh, you know, had the studio within Mills College. And Pauline was the director there from 66 to 67. But then she left and... Um, taught uh, somewhere else uh, for a very long time before she moved to New York. UCSD? UCSD, I want to say, is correct. So, yeah. um, so she was kind of on her own path. Like, she was definitely part of that scene, but it wasn't her, uh, it wasn't like her baby. It wasn't her idea, and um, she kind of moved on from it and was working on her own pursuits. Um, which she has won a ton of awards for. So let's circle back to the expanded instrument system. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it because it's kind of a, I guess she liked to coin terms for things. From what I understand, it was two tape recorders and creating delay to simulate the experience of being in a, in a space. And she used two, I believe, so that she could create a longer delay using the playhead of one and a record head of another, I think something like that. And she could actually move the machines further apart and use like a longer loop of tape to get like really long delays, which I think is also a lot to do with like the how Frippertronics is, mm -hmm. is done. So, uh, I heard someone ask her, uh, you know, if she found music to be a spiritual experience and like if she found a, like a spiritual path from the work she was doing with music and if those things uh, lined up and she actually just said like deep listening is her spiritual practice. She's very cut and dry. She just kind of leaves you hanging. I will say there's this really great uh, interview that she did at the Red Bull Music Academy. Um, so... Yeah. So, so it's good. It's one of the best. And she clears up all of the things that you might think about, you know, her journey and who all she knew. Well, I think one of the, the best things is when um, the interviewer says, uh, Mort Sabotnik told this story about how you asked him to throw a piano down the stairs so that you could put it back together again and like record what that sounded like. And she literally just started laughing and was like, that wasn't me. <laughs> She, she's, she's like, Mort has quite the imagination. He tells, she's like, this wasn't the first time I've heard someone tell me something that Mort Sabotnik said about me that was never true, that did not happen. Right, yeah, oh, she's like, oh, it's spring. very possible that Mort said this. Yes. But that doesn't mean but that's that true. that did not happen. Now she, like we said, she spent a lot of time teaching um, and then eventually moved to upstate New York not upstate, like the Hudson Valley, um, in, in the late 80s, and um, but I believe she stayed there until she passed. Um, and, you know, spent a lot of time doing these meditations and these workshops. And, um, you know, I'm interested to learn more about any of the uh, recordings she may have done, like, later in her life. I didn't find as much later in her life as I did early on. She did a ton of stuff. There's a compilation of her work when she was at Mills College that's really long and really cool. Um, just a lot of like, what sounds like 
test equipment and tape delay. Mm. So if, if you like that kind of stuff, if you consider that sound to be music, then you'll probably enjoy that. Um, stay safe, stay healthy. Have a great week. We'll be chatting more about Pauline Oliveros and doing stay some cosmic. deep listening practices together. So uh, yeah, stay cosmic and we'll talk to you soon.